Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. The session um, that you're here to listen to and participate in is going to look at the strategic shifts and the transformational issues that are going to set the global security context for this year and beyond. It's going to be a riveting discussion, knowing these gentlemen, thanks to them, and thanks to you. We're looking forward to your questions. And we're going to be spotting the emerging patterns that are going to set the trajectory, not just for this year, but really the things that are going to shape our world um, in the years to come as well. Um, we have a fantastic panel here today. I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, as there's no other way to do them justice. Uh, we have Ian Bremer, who's the Global Research Professor at the uh, New York University in the United States. We have John Chipman, who's the Chief Executive of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in the United Kingdom. We have Mahmoud Sarogalam, who's the Professor of International Relations at the National University of Iran, and who's just told me that his name means quick pen, so he's destined to be an academic, clearly. And Dr. Xavier Solana, who's President of the Center for Global Economy and Geopolitics in Spain. And also Professor Wu Sinbo, who's the Executive Dean at the Institute for International Studies at the Fudan University in the People's Republic of China. So we cover the world today, both uh, in human spirit and in the issues that we're going to cover. Uh, the panel is going to take you on an intellectual tour de force of the shifting sands of world power and the implications that this has for human <coughs> state and geosecurity. Um, I'm going to ask um, that the panel um, start with a few reflections on some of the key issues that we've seen take root over the past few months um, and those that really might uh, shape uh, the issues that governments and states will be responding to in geopolitical terms uh, in the months to come. It's been a year, uh, if we look at the past year, of some pretty seismic shifts. We've seen significant changes of leadership across the world, particularly in China and Iran. We've seen turmoil wrought by conflict, by environmental catastrophe, by cyber controversy, among many other things. We've seen the hardening of religious schisms, uh, particularly uh, between Sunni and Shia, and the implications that this has had for the factions and geopolitical alliances um, in the Middle East, but also elsewhere in the world. And so some of the things that we're going to touch on today, I hope will sweep across the globe, but also uh, really, really get to grips with the underlying themes that no matter where we're from, uh, are themes that we're going to have to think about and themes that we are going to have to address. I'm going to turn first... Um, and just before I do, to say this uh, session is uh, recorded live, um, so it is on the record, and uh, social media is permitted. Feel free to uh, let rip on Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, and um, I, I'm going to turn to uh, John first and to ask John to help us set the scene. And John, could you please just chart for us what for you have been three really pivotal shifts uh, that you've seen either having taken root or taking root that you think are going to prove transformative in, in the months and year ahead? Thank you very much. Well, the challenge of um, a Davos session is always to think both extemporaneously and epigrammatically, so I shall try to um, sum up uh, three uh, trends that um, have been apparent um, this year and invite people to think whether the opposite trends mm -hmm. uh, might be more apparent in 2014. Um, 2013, from a Western point of view, in terms of the larger powers of the West that have traditionally had an interest in international security, 2013 was the year of living tactically. It was a year in which it was very difficult for the United States and its principal allies to think and act strategically about the conflicts uh, with which they had to engage. Everything was really about conflict management, conflict avoidance, um, occasionally about uh, containment. It was about iterative approaches, about rounds of talks. Uh, but a strategic goal was very difficult to fashion and a strategic impetus uh, very difficult uh, to maintain, and a classic case of that was, of course, in Syria, uh, where I think uh, the response of the outside world to Syria was immensely tactical, uh, and as soon as we used to say, um, uh, tactics is usually, uh, without strategy, is usually the noise before uh, defeat, and the Syrian problem has defeated uh, the West. So my first point, it was very much a year of living tactically. The second point I have is that it was also the end of the sort of romantic era of thinking that democratic change would naturally occur in the most difficult parts of the world. Between 2011 and 2012, there was an enormous enthusiasm in Western capitals for the promise of the Arab Spring, for the possibility that youth movements and civil society would be able to take political root in these countries and defeat the, until then, very authoritarian uh, leaderships. And the 
megalomania of other types of actors in these political spaces was perhaps uh, hugely underestimated. It was, I think, very disturbing for some to see how uh, coldly um, some Western countries uh, looked at the changes, particularly in the Middle East, as acts of political science. Uh, is this a military coup or is this not a military coup? Is this true democracy or not true democracy? There was almost a, a cold observation of these very heated uh, disputes as if they were removed from uh, real human uh, reality and in the hope that an ideal perfect world could be shaped around a democratic outcome, especially uh, in Egypt. And I think by the end of 2013, uh, a more realist hold took over uh, Western capitals and an, an, an assumption that one had to um, muddle through and deal with the um, forces on the ground as they shaped uh, themselves. And I think the third trend that we saw during uh, 2013 was the limits of the more egalitarian international order uh, that people had talked about. Uh, everybody seemed to begin celebrating, uh, except in the United States, the um, rise of uh, outside powers and the greater role that, that rising powers would have in the international system. And it is true that powers are rising, but it's not clear that they know what they do once they get to the top. Um, and certain middle powers who are developing a, a kind of strategic swagger, an ability to influence events regionally, Qatar, Turkey, Brazil, were seized by different types of domestic imperatives that meant that they could no longer pursue the very extrovert foreign policies that would promise some sort of uh, regional accent to, to conflict management. So last year was the year of living tactically, the end of the Romantic era in terms of the promise of democracy uh, and uh, a realization that an egalitarian uh, world order or a more egalitarian one wouldn't mean, mean better conflict management. And 2014, in much quicker summary, uh, the promise and, and challenge of 2014 is whether the opposite might take hold, hmm. whether 2014 might be the year of living strategically, but perhaps the year of strategic conceits in which countries like China, Japan, do develop genuine strategic uh, uh, objectives for themselves in their region and more widely, but that strategic competition has um, unhappy consequences. Uh, the obverse of the um, uh, inspiration that democratic movements inspired is the question of whether authoritarianism might have a, a resurgence in different parts of the world in 2014, and people will have to sup more frequently with the devil than they were hoping to do in 2013. And the obverse of a more egalitarian world order where smaller uh, powers are able to productively uh, uh, work um, for conflict management is that some small power might again uh, create some crisis uh, in which others will have to... Uh, to which others will have to respond, whether it's a North Korea or whether uh, it's actually uh, a power, say, in the Asia-Pacific, overconfident in the American alliance, uh, provoking a larger power by uh, extending its uh, reach further than its own national power would permit. Uh, so I think those are the trends that I observe, and in uh, the Middle East, in Europe, in Asia, and in Latin America, uh, they hold in, in different measure. But I think that's uh, the sort of spirit that framed 2013 and some of the spirit that might frame 2014. Thank you, John. Um, characteristically potent and pertinent. And Mahmoud, if I could um, turn to you and um, feel free to reflect on any of the things that John has laid out there, but also obviously um, with the new presidency um, in Iran, it's interesting that um, uh, John mentioned there the end of uh, the end of the kind of romantic era and the beginning of uh, reality bites. And uh, President Rouhani has said explicitly that um, Iranian policy is going to be based in reality. What does that mean for Iran's role in the world? And how particularly do you see that playing out um, in the new formations that are taking shape in the uh, Middle East um, post-Arab Spring? Yeah, thank you. Um, as a student of Iranian politics, um, I think the Rouhani presidency is perhaps the only opportunity for Iranians um, to lift themselves economically and to uh, engage the international community. Um, the Rouhani presidency is perhaps the outcome of 30 years of, uh, of um, uh, ideological uh, processes in the country. Uh, and I think uh, the most important contribution of this presidency is that it is global sensitive. This presidency is very much concerned about Iran's image around the world. Uh, and I think for the first time, we have a president in Iran who understands statistics. Um, uh, on that point, I think um, uh, Iran's economy is going to be the focal point in the next four years. It took some courage and uh, realism from the uh, 
political establishment in Iran uh, to engage uh, uh, the P5 plus one in its nuclear negotiations uh, in order to stop Iran's national economic decline. Okay. Uh, when we compare Iran to other countries in the region, even UAE, let alone Turkey uh, and other Muslim countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, Iran uh, has lost uh, uh, quite a bit uh, economic opportunities uh, in the last uh, years. And I think uh, it was not just this presidency, uh, any presidency would have been coerced into focusing on Iran's national economic development. Uh, to do that, uh, it was uh, very clear that Iran had to change its foreign policy orientation. And in that context, the nuclear problem uh, was the central issue. And I think the government moved very quickly uh, in the first month uh, of the administration so in our inauguration uh, to focus on that issue, and gladly, I think we have come forward uh, quite a bit just in the last few months. Um, but aside from Iran's uh, national economy, which needs uh, very uh, close attention and uh, bringing Iran back into the European community, international community, and so on, I think there is one major challenge that Iran is facing in its foreign policy. It is not just... Uh, uh, a reorientation of Iranian-American relations. For the first time, Iranian uh, foreign minister and American secretary of state met and talked and engaged one another, and that was a great breakthrough in the uh, long history uh, of post-revolutionary uh, Iran. But I think the greatest challenge for Iran today uh, in its foreign policy is Iranian-Saudi relations. Um, uh, there is almost no connection between the two countries today. And as long as uh, there is no compromise between these two uh, important players in the region, I think none of the Middle Eastern issues in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, the Palestinian issue, uh, Persian Gulf security, uh, and also uh, even uh, uh, an improvement in the nuclear negotiations uh, cannot be expected. So. Uh, alongside, in parallel, with the economic improvements uh, in Iran, I think there is that outstanding challenge that Iran is facing. And the sooner we uh, engage Saudi Arabia, the sooner many of the outstanding issues in the region are going to be resolved. Mahmoud, thank you. And maybe the Iran-Saudi dynamic is one of the things that we want to return to. I'm sure some of the other panelists would have some very interesting things to say, and no doubt the audience as well. Um, Ian, to come to you, I mean, we heard there that um, uh, at least a, a supposition that a part of the motivation for uh, the thawing between um, Iran and the US is driven from the Iranian side by the need to reverse um, its current economic fortunes. Do you think that's enough uh, to, to drive a kind of perestroika? Um, and how, that, how is that going to play out um, in, in the US? Um, and if you could talk um, about um, relations there and then also look eastwards, um, particularly in terms of the... Uh, East Asian uh, relationship and how the uh, much touted and questioned uh, uh, Pacific pivot is going, that would be much appreciated. Oh, the pivot's not going. That's <laughs> uh, a problem. No, I mean, John, John asked if, the tw if 2014 might be the year of living strategically. Uh, might not this be the year that we could talk about reshaping the world uh, as the WEF decided to make this the, uh, the theme? No. Uh, we're not, uh, because in order to start thinking strategically, you have to at least have the United States that wants to do that on the international stage. It's very clear the U.S. does not want to do that. The U.S. has the capability, doesn't want to do it, and doesn't want to do it for some good reasons, for some legitimate reasons, and maybe for some not so legitimate, maybe for some short-sighted readings, but we're not even close to having that conversation. We won't be for, I think, at least a couple of years, barring something cataclysmic that we don't want to think about on, on this panel. So I think the answer is no. Uh, and that's going to inform my conversation on the pivot and the rest. But let's just talk about Middle East Iran for a second, because my colleague, I thought, was extremely articulate on this. Saudi Arabia-Iran is a big problem. It is. 
the U.S. I mean, the U.S. relations, U.S. foreign policy is in decline right now. U.S. economy is not in decline. Foreign policy is, and we can talk about why. Snowden, Syria, Obama, second-term team, Obama shutdown. You know, difficulties with the you know sort of orientation alignment with countries like China and Russia. Uh, Germany led Europe as opposed to Britain and France led Europe. There are so many reasons why U.S. foreign policy is in decline. It's really overdetermined, right? Um, but but in the middle, but and, and the U.S. has lost as a consequence a lot of support of a lot of its allies that are worried. I mean, the Germans, the France on, uh, France on Snowden, a lot of the Asians on TPP slowing down, that kind of thing. The Saudis are the one relationship that's actually gotten worse in large part because it should be getting worse. Mm -hmm. uh, American-Saudi relations are no longer based on strategic interests of these two countries. And that is the problem, right? The Saudis are right to not want a deal with Iran between the Iranians and the international community. It's very bad for them. They are correct in that understanding of their national interests. Um, they, they were so upset they decided to walk away from a seat at the Security Council. Um, they, they don't want the Iranians to produce more oil. They don't want an 80 million person Iranian economy to become dynamic in the region. They don't want it geopolitically in Iraq or in Lebanon or in Syria or anywhere else. This is an unmitigated bad for Saudi Arabia. Now, one place I, I disagree a little bit is I still think a deal's possible. Because it's not just the Iranians need the cash, that the Americans want out. Uh, you know, 50, the Americans, 56% more oil is being produced by the Americans right now than it was in 2008. The Americans are at least 56% less interested in the Middle East now than they were in 2008. It's not just because of the energy. It's because of Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's because of the nature of the Obama administration. It's because of the gap between rich and poor, and 50% of Americans at least thinking, what do we get out of all of this? There's plenty of reasons, again. But the fact is that what the Americans would really like to do is take this international coalition that you've used to squeeze the Iranians economically very effectively for a number of years right now and use it to get a deal, let them produce, let folks invest. We're not it. We've seen that in Syria, we've seen it in Libya, we've seen it in Egypt. <clears throat> How many places do we need to see it? So I think this is consistent. I, I guess you could call that thinking strategically. I, I doubt it's the way that folks want the U.S. to be thinking strategically. It's certainly a problem for China over the long term. So quick points just on that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll seed, seed. Um, which is that um, Kerry has not mentioned the term pivot, uh, and, and he's told his folks that they shouldn't, uh, so they're not allowed. He talks about rebalancing. Those things are different. Pivot, you take one foot, that's one place, you move it to another place. Rebalancing, you just kind of shift back and forth ineffectually. That, that's more uh, what we're seeing. Um, I, I, th this is clearly a team that doesn't have as much the trust of President Obama as Hillary Clinton and Confederates did, and Obama doesn't, isn't as interested in foreign policy himself, so that's an issue. It's also a team that doesn't do much on Asia. They don't have much background or expertise on Asia. That's an opportunity for the Chinese. They know it, they see it. And certainly we're seeing a Chinese charm offensive towards the US, which I think has been somewhat effective, both in improving that bilateral relationship, but also in helping to drive a bit of a wedge between the US and Japan, response to the air defense identification zone, uh, response to, to Abe's Yasukuni shrine visit, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Long term, what is interesting to me is that the Middle East is becoming vastly more important to China than it is to the US. And yet the Chinese don't wear, even with this second aircraft carrier they're now talking about building, are nowhere near capable of doing anything with that, that the Americans are. So is there a deal? That for me is the interesting question. Because the point is the Americans are still putting all of this military cash in Asia because there's no multilateral security deal. The Chinese want the US to continue to play the role of global policemen in the Middle East they're going to have to come to terms that they need to be multilateral on some security arrangement in Asia. I think that is a deal that can be discussed. Uh, I don't know if it can be done, but at least it's a fruitful avenue for, uh, for consideration in, in terms of a new security environment. Mm. Ian, thank you. Does that, uh, Professor Wee, does that accord with your view from the Chinese perspective um, in terms of that explanation? And do you think such a deal is possible? Maybe you can just talk us through how you're seeing the transformative issues in um, East Asian security policy at the moment and how, again, new leadership is affecting China's role in the world um, at the moment? Well, let me start um, by sharing with you my observation about the um, new foreign policy of mm -hmm. uh, President Xi Jinping. And um, in contrast with uh, Ian's frustration with Obama's foreign policy, um, in China, I think most people feel comfortable uh, with the, the new leadership's foreign policy 
the most important uh, feature is that uh, the growing diplomatic activity. Uh, if you uh, look at China's, um, uh, for example, exerting uh, more pressure on North Korea, uh, its nuclear program, uh, China's involvement in South Sudan to try to uh, mediate the, the uh, conflict. So basically, uh, this diplomatic activism is rooted on a recognition of China's responsibility as a rising power, and also uh, um, a realization of the need to protect China's growing overseas interests. So, um, and related to that is uh, last year, the new leadership uh, began to pay more, more attention to our relations with our uh, neighbors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, partly because of the troubles that uh, come up in the previous years. Uh, the challenge is that as China rises, how you want to assure your neighbors that you are not going to be a threat and you are going to share with them the prosperity. You are going to uh, bring more security to this region. So in this regard, I think the new leadership is facing a challenge. How to deal with a neighborhood that sometimes is suspicious of China's rise and sometimes eager to share the benefits of China's economic development. And one more thing with the uh, new uh, diplomacy is um, how to respond to the public opinion in China mm -hmm. as people have more venues to express their opinions about you know, how they want our foreign policy to uh, do a better job in promoting China's overseas interests, including in dealing with the disputes with some other uh, neighbors, including with Japan. So these are not necessarily you know, on the same page. So this is a challenge for the new leadership, how you keep a good balance among all those uh, uh, items. Now back to the uh, regional security in East Asia, we are not in a, a, a pleasant situation at the moment. You have the shifting uh, balance of power because of the rise of China. You have the changing domestic politics mm -hmm. in Japan and even in North Korea. And you have the strategic adjustments undertaken by uh, the Obama administration, starting from its fourth term, the rebalancing, pivoting, whatever you call it, uh, uh, at least uh, emphasizing more on the security investment in the Asia Pacific. So all those factors combined, they are making this uh, um, situation more um, complex and fluid. However, I'm not that uh, pessimistic about 2014 because I think one, as long as China and the US have a, a stable strategic relationship and things are not going to uh, 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 get in too uh, bad. And last year, I think the new leadership, President Xi had a, a good meeting with uh, President Obama in California and which uh, helped um, two sides to better understand each other and also to build a, a better uh, mechanism for communication. And more importantly, uh, I think both countries began to realize that they may be able to do a better job to you know, constrain some of the troublemakers in this region, be it Abe in Japan or North Korea. So as long as China and US have a strategic uh, 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 stability in this region, I think the overall situation we are not uh, uh, become uh, too bad in 2014. I will stop here. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, finally, to come to Dr. Solana before we probe a couple of these issues further, but um, you obviously <coughs> represented the European Union and its foreign policy on all of these issues, in fact, when you were in office. Um, I mean, can you just speak to how you think the world has changed fundamentally from the negotiations you had at that time on Iran, on, on, the, on um, the Pacific, et cetera? And <coughs> what for you would you wish that you'd seen in terms of openings that are happening now when you were in office? And what are you, do you think are some of the moments that might be missed unless there's a real kind of concerted international leadership? Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm the last to speak. I can say that I... I agree with just about everything that has been said so far. Um, being a European and talking about 2014 brings to your mind uh, 100 years ago, mm. 1914. Mm. Uh, difference from 1914 to 2014 are many. Risks are also, they were many. At that time, were not known. 
there are many today which uh, are known, some others are not known. But uh, I think that in analysis is still uh, is an uh, intelligent attitude to look at the years of today. Now, one important thing is that Europe is not a problem. In 1914, Europe was the problem. Today, I don't know if it's part of the solution. I hope it's part of the solution, but in any case, it's not part of the problem. And that is, uh, allows uh, for an important part of developed countries to be able to, to help in the process of peace, not in the process of war. That is a very important achievement. Now, I think that, uh, to my mind, what it comes is uh, two missing things which if we could work in the coming years to resolve will be very important. And these missing things are uh, structures of regional integration on security. The two main problems that we have today, starting for the first, I think is Iran. If we are not able to get Iran resolved in a peaceful manner in the year 2014, we may be in a situation very, very serious. Um, I don't think that we are going to be able to get a structure of security in the Middle East tomorrow. But I think if we don't begin to think strategically and trying to construct a structure of security in that region of the Middle East, we will be for a long time in very serious pain. And I think if we want to look strategically, to think strategically, that should be done. Now, the second in the, in the other problem, in the other region that we may have a problem in the years ahead of us, which is uh, East Asia, East Asia uh, is not integrating as we would have liked it. I think the big countries of East Asia, Japan and China, didn't profit from the end of the Second, second Great War. In Europe, we did something fantastic. Germany and French, after the Second Great War, found a manner of reconciliation. In East Pacific, China and Japan didn't profit from that. Mao Zedong opened relations with China, but it didn't go any further than that. A sort of reconciliation between China and, and, and Japan will be fundamental. It's not easy, it's not going to pay in 24 hours, but I think with uh, engaging that with what we have already in Asia, with East ASEAN, which is true that the integration comes from the small countries, not from the big countries in Asia, whereas in, 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 in Europe was uh, different, but uh, in Europe, it was done politically. It was a political decision to integrate. In Asia, and East Asia, it's been done, but driven by market forces. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this loose is not legal. It doesn't have rules of the game. But it does the reality, which is it, it, it's moving. It's no doubt it is moving. If you look at it, in the in the trades among Euro countries, the European Union is about 60%. In uh, Eastern Asia, it's about 45%. I mean, it's, it's a lot that has been done without rules, just by the, the um, rules of the market. If we were able to get that and take a step forward into some kinds of rules, I think would be a very, very important thing. And that is the, the two strategic issues that if I were in power, I would try to do. Construct or put all my energy in constructing a structure of security in places where it don't exist. Europe is today safe because uh, it, it found a strategy of security or the institution of security that allowed them to get out of the, of the situation of crisis. Now, one thing that I would like to say on East Asia, I'm very concerned related to, to, to Iran, also to the nuclear issue, that if North Korea is not uh, approached in a much more assertive manner, after the Hanoi uh, year, the summit of Hanoi, you remember very well, the IRF, uh, if that is not resolved, my fear is that temptations of South Korea, temptations in Japan to move in the nuclear front. Mm. And that will be really a catastrophic situation. As you know, Japan did something, then it stopped, and South Korea had done much, but in any case, if there were motion in that direction, it would be really catastrophic. So this is what I would like to say. It is, Basically, that uh, this will be the most important thing. So that to finish on a negative note, I think the 2013 has been the year of uh, the end of multilateralism in a way. Mm. Uh, the United Nations has not functioned. Even today, we have uh, the meeting in Geneva has started very badly. I don't think we can have done it in a more unprofessional manner to, to, <laughs> to, to get the, 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 the beginning of, of, of the Geneva Geneva. Um, we are going to enter into two very important trade uh, agreements, which are not multilateral, the TTP and the European Union and, and, the, 
and the United States agreement. It is true that the WTO has been published, but I don't think that compensates that uh, multilateralism is going down. And that is uh, another thing to, to have uh, to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. A collective tour de force there. I want to pick up on a couple of the issues that you've raised and just probe you further collectively on them before opening to the floor with questions. Um, I mean, some very coherent themes, I think, came out of all of your comments, and I think there's a degree of alignment, but it's always interesting to push you on where you might disagree as well. Um, so you talked a lot about recalibration, both in terms of absolute power and both in terms of regional balances of power. And within that, I think uh, two strands came out quite clearly, one between Iran and Saudi and one between... China and Japan, and obviously the US's relationship with all those players is pivotal to that. So maybe just starting um, on the first, and to open up to all of you, um, what do you think, what are, what's your own prognosis for how the relationship between China and Japan is going to play out over this year? Um, and what are going to be the things that enable it to um, uh, uh, play out constructively? And what might be the things that put it in jeopardy? Who'd like to take that first? Well, I'll start because then I can give a shorter answer and everybody can add a little bit more uh, nuance. Uh, I think uh, political tension at the highest level between China and Japan will be very intense for at least a, a year to come. Uh, the relationship between the two um, heads of government are very uh, poor uh, and uh, opinion nationally in each of the countries is, is increasingly nationalistic. So I think there will be a lot of political posturing uh, they will, it'll be very difficult to, to achieve meetings of the two of them in the same room, let alone necessarily face-to-face. -face. Uh, and so the real question is, what, what is going to be done underneath the surface? And I think there's been an awful lot of concern as to whether in the East China Sea there would be a war between uh, Japan and China. I'm certain that, the, uh, the, that, that both governments want to uh, avoid one. The way in which it could more easily be av uh, uh, avoided is if the militaries of both countries began having more quiet um, conversations about what professionals call confidence uh, building measures or avoiding incidents at sea or, or in the air. And my own sense from having talked to the militaries of both countries is that there is a willingness to have uh, these quiet discussions. It's always remarkable to me in whatever area of the world I travel in that it's the militaries of the countries that are naturally opposed to have the best professional understanding of each other, whether it's uh, 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 India and Pakistan or, 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 or any other couplet that you might imagine. The militaries tend to understand the severity of war and the way in which accidents uh, can happen. So if we see underneath the surface more military-to-military -military discussions between Japan and China, which I'm sure the United States and others will seek uh, to encourage, then the avoidance of of war will be there, but the strategic competition, and this is the sense in which I use the word strategy, I agree with Ian that I'm not certain that the United States will assume a much more ostentatious strategic posture, but the United States is not the only country in the world that might think strategically or develop strategic conceits, and China and Japan, I think, are competing strategically, and not just in their own region. Japan is traveling a great deal to Africa, China mm. to Latin America. Uh, you will see an extra version of these two countries in other regions of the world live to win votes for their point of view that I think will be important. So enormous strategic competition between the two countries, very difficult personal relations between the two leaders, but perhaps professional understandings that avoid war. In? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think China and Japan are thinking more strategically on these issues, and Africa is a great example of it. Just, it's not global uh, in the sense that it can't replace the U.S., and that's Javier's concern at the end, which I completely embrace. Um, I, I want to answer China and Japan, but I just want to point out that we, we have, I think we have agreed on something quite important. I think we all do. But the two most important bilateral geopolitical tensions in the world in 2014 are Iran, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and the China, Japan. Mm -hmm. I, I, China, Japan is more important in the sense it has more impact, even though it's less likely. Uh, but, but nonetheless, that's where I'd focus. We did not mention Israel. Israel relationship is much more stable, and they can deal with an Iranian deal. Their relationship with the U.S. is, frankly, even though Obama and Netanyahu don't like each other at all, the relationship is much more stable. And we didn't mention Russia at all, because while Russia annoys all of us, and it's, it's irritating in its backyard, nobody cares very much. Uh, and and that, that's interesting too, right? But on China, Japan, you know, my, my friend Shinbo here referred to Abe as one of the two troublemakers in the region, mm -hmm. the second being Kim Jong-un. I've never heard Abe and Kim Jong-un referred to in the same sentence that way. Maybe we'll promote that. Um, I think there are a lot of people, but to be fair, Sh Shinbo is not an out there crazy extremist in China. This is, this is completely middle-of-the-road thinking, which is that the Japanese are ne crazy nationalist problems. 
And, and there's overwhelming hatred and, on the part of the Chinese for Japan. The Japanese don't like the Chinese at all either. Huge stereotyping between these two countries. There's a lot of economic integration. It's important. They'd both be hurt if attention flared. But the level of misunderstanding, the level of stereotyping, I mean, the Europeans had great economic integration before they went to war too. I, I don't think we're going to see military conflict intentionally but we are entering an environment where not only are mistakes possible, but the likelihood of overreaction and miscalculation and response to those mistakes, given the fact that neither of these two countries have any interest in engaging or trying to understand the perspective from the other country. There is no interest on the part of the Chinese leadership of understanding the security environment from Japan's point of view. That is completely reciprocal. That's a problem. If these guys had religion in the mix, they'd be a real problem. They don't have that. But the history is problematic enough, right? That's where we are. 2014 is looking up thanks to that. Simba, I've got to bring you in there and ask you what you think. Well, uh, will there be a war between um, China and Japan over the um, Jiaoyu Islands? Um, no, because um, China doesn't want to fight a war. Uh, Japan does not dare to fight a war. And the US is not willing to get involved in a conflict with China over Jiaoyu Islands. So strategically speaking, Although, you know, the temperature is very high rhetorically, but strategically speaking, um, the possibility for a military conflict, serious military conflict over the Diaoyu Islands is very low. Having said that, I have to say that the political trust between two countries now is very low. Mm -hmm. And largely because of Abe's recent visit to the uh, Yasukuni Shirai, it's somewhat different thing that you took a strong, assertive position on the island disputes. It's a different thing that you pay the visit to the Yaskuni Shrine and try to, you know, uh, uh, send a different message about the World War II history and all these all this kind of things. That, you know, did a lot really to raise the nationalism in China about relations with Japan. So to some extent, I think, China's leaders have already written off Abe as a credible uh, uh, partner in the future. So that means uh, <coughs> the political relations between our two countries will stay very cool, even frozen, uh, 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 for the uh, remaining uh, uh, years of Abe uh, administration. And then the question is, what can be done? Mm. One thing I think is important is that because Neither Beijing nor Tokyo nor Washington want to see a war in East China Sea. I think we should do a better job technically to create better mechanism of communication and also crisis management system to manage those issues. Okay. Secondly, I think in this regard, the, the United States can do be a better job in spite of you know uh, uh, Ian's frustration with Obama's. <coughs> Uh, 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 foreign diplomacy, I think the U.S. at least on two issues can be helpful. One is on the history <coughs> issue, how we think about World War II history, what you know, the U.S. should respond to you know, Abe's future visit to Yasukuni, Shirai, all these kind of things. I think the U.S. should further clarify its position on this issue. And secondly, in terms of the island disputes in this East China say, I think Abe may need this dispute to justify his pushing his own security agenda, expanding Japan's military, uh, 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 and also revising the uh, constitution. So the US should tell the difference between the island dispute between China and Japan and also what Japan is going to do on the security front. Those are two different things. My suspect is that at the end of the day, Abe wants to <coughs> pursue a more independent security policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Let me, in, let me just come back to you on that before we then move to mm. Saudi Iran. Um, is that in the realm of reality in terms of how the US is going to engage on this? Uh, no. I mean, the idea that the United States is <coughs> going to clarify its position on Yasukuni 
That's a very smart thing for China to want because, again, it helps to try to drive a wedge between the U.S. and Japan. That the, the United States doesn't like that. That's not, that's not a proactive national interest of the Americans. That's just something that the Chinese will continue to try, and occasionally they'll pick up a couple points on. But, but I don't see anyone in the Obama administration doing that. Okay, so we see a glacial East Asia as it's depicted here. And if we move then towards Iran and Saudi, I imagine that has the potential to be more overtly combustible. Um, Mahmoud, can you just um, tell us, I mean, um, just to start with you first from the Iranian perspective and then to bring in Dr. Solana, um, what, what, I mean, if this, is going to, if this is going to roll out in a way that doesn't prove really fundamentally destructive, um, what's needed? Uh, what do you think are the concessions that will be needed from the Iranian side, um, looking, you know, very frankly at, at, <coughs> at the Iranian side, but also from the Saudi side, and who needs to broker that? Um, I think there are two very interesting, fascinating um, repercussions of the Arab Spring uh, for the whole region. One is that the, the public in the Middle East at large and also the elites learned that legitimacy and accountability cannot be outsourced. And uh, secondly, um, people have learned that they are going to be more autonomous uh, than the past. Um, they have to make their own decisions. And uh, people have become very much empowered. Um, so <clears throat> looking at that, I think Middle East is moving, uh, historically speaking, in the right path where national sovereignty is, uh, uh, is uh, being redefined in terms of uh, uh, non-zero sum games in the region. Uh, I do not believe that Iranian-Saudi rivalry is a religious one. Um, Iranian-Saudi rivalry was mm. there even before the revolution. Mm. I think the fundamental nature of that rivalry is uh, regional supremacy. And until the two sides um, have uh, a different definition of the region and also their national sovereignties, uh, then uh, uh, we cannot expect uh, to have compromises on uh, any side. That's one. The other issue that both countries need to reach uh, a national consensus about the other uh, uh, party. Uh, there was a time in the 1960s uh, when isolationalism was equal to uh, national sovereignty during the Soviet and, and, uh, and Chinese years. Uh, I think that has been uh, broken nowadays in the Middle East. We cannot uh, think of isolationalism as, a, as, a, as an option. Um, the individuals who are shaping the future of the Middle East, who have shaped and are still shaping the future of the Middle East, uh, are people like Bill Gates, uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg and, uh, and also uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, these are the individuals who are uh, empowering the public. Uh, I think more and more people are learning about uh, pluralism, uh, diversity, uh, transparency, accountability, legitimacy, and, uh, and, and having a collective national identity. Uh, those issues are faced by both Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, perhaps um, because of the wealth of these two countries, and also particularly the human resources that <clears throat> Iran has as a country, uh, I think uh, uh, what needs to be uh, taken as an initi initiative on both sides is to have a, a regional uh, uh, new definition of uh, politics and geopolitics. Uh, I think the ramification of this will be seen in Iraq. Uh, a stable Iraq, I think, will be a consequence of Iranian-Saudi cooperation. Uh, and also, I believe uh, uh, there are two levels about Syria, Russian-American relations, and second level is Iranian-Saudi relations. Uh, and unless uh, Iranian-Saudi relations are improved, I think we cannot expect uh, a very clear positive outcome uh, in the Syrian scene. Uh, that can take us to Lebanon, to the Palestinian territories, and also uh, the security of the Persian Gulf. Uh, I think all those issues will deal with an Iranian-Saudi uh, uh, cooperation. Now, having said that, I believe, at least from an Iranian perspective, from what I can witness uh, about the debates and also the economic uh, 
uh, exigencies in the country today in Iran that Iran will ultimately move uh, for a rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, but Saudi Arabia also needs to have a different definition of Iranian regional role uh, and cannot uh, expect Iran uh, to limit itself uh, as a regional uh, uh, power. Uh, I think uh, Iranian history, Iranian um, culture uh, is omnipresent, uh, not only in Iraq, but also in Central Asia, in many Arab countries. Uh, and there is quite a bit of potential for Iranian economy uh, to move on to the region. There is only 6% trade among Middle Eastern countries. Some 94% of the trade is done uh, with the outside world. And there's so much potential for Iran uh, to get into the uh, regional trade framework. So I think it will happen, at least from the Iranian side, because Iran is moving into an economic mood. Uh, this is the mood of the population, which uh, I think the new presidency is resonating. And uh, within the next year, I think uh, there will be a much more uh, solid and sound consensus within Iran uh, to reach a rapprochement with Saudi uh, uh, foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Salan, if we're looking optimistically, one, do you buy this? Do you think, do you, do you think that that's going to eventuate? And are you so hopeful that the shift um, in the way that uh, particularly the younger kind of demographic is engaging with politics and their own future could help precipitate a greater open-mindedness here. And what's going to be the role of the European Union? Is it irrelevant in brokering this rapprochement, or does it have a role to play still? Um, and, um, and then we'll hear from others. OK. Yeah. <coughs> let, let me first have a couple of comments before I go to the last part of your question. I think that uh, the Saudi-Iranian uh, rapprochement is going to be very difficult uh, in the short term, because the Saudis do not have any strike. I mean, the, the, the aging of the leadership in Saudi Arabia is uh, is a paralyzing element. And until we don't see a change in the, in the Saudi Arabia, more uh, efficient uh, government, etc., it will be very difficult. Imagine that now the competition is between Iran with a new energetic reformer uh, leader, elected uh, pluralistically. And on the other side, we do have a situation which is completely the opposite. It's very difficult, even in those circumstances, to meet if they didn't have the, the past in the history. The second thing I think is very important to me that has not been brought up uh, is the, the um, uh, terrorism. Yeah. I think the fact that, that uh, Al Qaeda is there, Al Qaeda is Sunni, Al Qaeda is financed by who knows whom, but not very far from some of the countries we are talking about. Uh, that has to be clarified, and that the defeat to Al Qaeda has to be done by the Sunnis. And until Al Qaeda is not defeated by the Sunnis, it will not be a defeat. And that is the only thing that uh, Saudi Arabia can put on the table also to contribute to that. To that. Uh, to that. Now, last thing I would like to say is Russia. I think in Russia we have uh, put it in the we have not mentioned as a local regional problem, but. Uh, in the backyard of the European Union. But in the Middle East, Russia is taking a very important role. I think Russia has got in a strategy to the Middle East, and I think the Western world has shown that they don't have a strategy. We don't have a strategy. When you look at all the conflict of Syria, you have seen a Russia which had been pin, 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 with, and, and, and got to the end that he wanted. And the, today is a, is, a, is a very important day for Russia. And uh, the Europeans and the Americans, we have acted uh, in a not, uh, a strategic manner, and not even tactic, as being just, uh, just uh, non-professional, as I said, I said before. Now, mm, from the European Union point of view, I think that uh, in 2014, I would like to see, after the elections of the European Union, etc., change in the leadership in the European Union institutionally, I would see a more engagement. I, mean, I would like to see a much deeper engagement. And uh, outside our, our uh, uh, the European uh, uh, inner looking, I think the, the Middle East is our neighborhood. And, uh, and we have been, uh, in 1919, or 1914, uh, 19, uh, 1939, or 1913, I'm sorry, um, the end of that war is, is, is the origin of many of the problems we have today in the Middle East. Uh, so we have responsibilities also there, and I think we have to take again our shoulders that part of the responsibility. And that I try to do, and I, I like to, to, to continue doing and help. Now, a word about Iran. My experience with Iran, I've been in, engaged with Iran since 2002. I knew Rouhani in 2002. I signed with him in 2003. 
I was in his inauguration in 2013. I spent three days with him. Uh, I, what I can tell you that everything that he told me in those days of his inauguration has become true. All the things that he promised that he would do, it has been done. Now, this, the, 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 the agreement, which is a provisional agreement for six months, is a very important step. But what is ahead is, a, is very difficult. It's going to be very difficult. You have to be very careful, everybody. And signs change, uh, count, everything counts. And it's so important that this uh, negotiation comes out right that uh, I think that everybody should put the most uh, of their, on their side to get it through. OK, thank you very much. Um, we're going to um, open up for questions. And I'm sure the panellists have remarks on each other's remarks. But if they can build those into questions, I'm sure they'll be deft at doing so. When you um, ask your question, please could you identify yourself. There are roaming microphones. Um, and please don't feel constrained to ask questions on what we've already covered. The world is your oyster. Uh, you can cover absolutely anything you want and uh, put these great minds to use. So uh, the lady at the front here to start us off. Hi, Catherine Bennell from the New York Times. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. I've got two questions, one for Mr. Sarah Gualam. I would like to know from you what you think Iran can do to help in Syria. Uh, Syria has been called the Vietnam of Iran. You're bleeding human resources, you're bleeding money. Presumably you would like to get out. What is it that you can do and bring to the table? And Wu Jinbu, I would like to know as a German who grew up in Germany, spent 10 years in France, and is very glad that there once was a school book commission that sort of brought our histories together and aligned them and meant that we now have a similar vision, at least, um, on most issues. Is there such a thing, such an initiative underway? Has there ever been an effort to sort of try to reconcile your different hi histories in such a form? Um, let's start latterly and then, let's so you first, yeah. Well, um, certainly there have been um, some serious efforts um, between China and Japan um, to uh, reconcile of the history issue for example, in the 1980s, uh, the Japanese leader, uh, after visiting the shrine, and then they came to realize that you know they should pay more attention to relations with China. So this was no longer an issue at the political level. And also in the 1990s, uh, historians from China, Japan, and South Korea, they began to write a, a, a common history book about the modern history of East Asia so that they can reach some consensus about the modern history in this region. So those are important efforts made by both political leaders as well as the scholars. Um, but this began to change uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, one is that now you have some uh, Japanese politicians who either are driven by the uh, uh, understanding of history or even by their own ideology. They just wanted to uh, pay the visit to the shrine. So that brought the issue up again, reopened the issue. <clears throat> well, that history issue was mostly about history. It's not particularly about the disputes of the islands. It's about you know what happened uh, in the World War II, what Japan did in Korea, on the Korean Peninsula, in China, even though the historians couldn't agree with each other 100%, but basically they had a parameter of knowledge about what happened and tried to you know, promote the use of those history books in the three countries. Yes, um, uh, back to what I said, you know, in the last 10 years, you had some uh, uh, Japanese politicians who wanted to reopen this issue of Yasukuni Shrine. And also, uh, I think, Partly because uh, the changing uh, uh, regional context, which is maybe the rise of China, makes some Japanese politicians feel very uh, nervous, upset. They wanted to create a stronger Japan. And to, to get there, sometimes to look to the past from Japan's modern history, to get this kind of incentive and inspiration to show Japan's glory in its modern history. But it, it is exactly the wrong thing it should do if you want, really want to make Japan popular and stronger in this region. And frankly speaking, I think Abe's recent visit to the Yasukuni Shrine really uh, did a lot of damage to Japan's image, uh, simply for his personal 
belief or ideology, but mm. that's not in Japan's national interest. Um, and Mahmoud on Syria, I'm going to ask all the panellists to be as concise as possible so we can get as many questions in as possible um, on the Syria point. Yeah, I think Geneva 2 is a, um, is a sound framework for the ultimate resolution of the conflict. But in parallel to that, I think uh, uh, there needs to be an overall framework of understanding between Iran and Saudi Arabia on regional issues where, where Syria is going to be the pivotal uh, point in that framework. Um, Iran and Saudi Arabia are supporting the opposite forces in Syria, and unless um, uh, they come to an understanding about facilitating the rise of a uh, nation state in Syria, which is a, a common ground uh, and underpinning for all the forces within Syria, uh, then we can expect uh, uh, a much more um, rapid solution to the problem. Uh, and I think uh, uh, as long as Iran and Saudi Arabia do not come to that understanding, we're going to be seeing a protracted conflict in Syria. Thank you. I'm going to now take um, three questions at once, um, and um, we will um, then hand back over to the panel. Sir. Uh, Jean-Marc Guénaud, Columbia University, uh, former under Secretary for Peacekeeping at the UN. Uh, the panelists have spoken very eloquently to the traditional threats of power, clashes of power, that what makes the, 20, the early 21st century look a bit like the early 20th century. I want to ask them about the non-traditional uh, threats, those situations where the problem is not power against power, but the elusiveness of power, mm. where the state has lost control over its own territory. Uh, and we see uh, areas of the world where that's happening in a, in a significant scale. But after the experience of Afghanistan, after the experience of Iraq, after the precarious situation in Libya, there's a kind of uh, skepticism on what can be done about those uh, situations. And nevertheless, they do pose a strategic uh, threat. And so I would want some of the panelists to speak to that issue. Thank Fantastic. You. Well, that will be the first up. Thanks, Jean-Marie. Um, Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen here, and then lady here. So Tanaka uh, from Japan. Um, sorry to get on to uh, Sino-Japanese relations too much. Um, but one comment and one question to Ushinbo. Uh, one comment, I think uh, even a sophisticated scholar like Ushinbo uh, maintains a very stereotypical uh, view of uh, a fairly complicated issue of uh, Prime Minister's visit to Yasukuni Shrine. It's rather sad for me. Um, the, um, there are uh, many uh, in Japan who criticize the Prime Minister uh, because of the difference of opinions. But I would argue that very few uh, believe that he was trying to overtopple the uh, international order created after the Second World War. Uh, that was totally you know, out of imagination for many of the Japanese uh, who uh, observing this uh, event. Um, question uh, to <coughs> my friend Shin Bo is, um, the, um, as you mentioned, uh, referred to Prime Minister as a troublemaker. Um, so do many uh, Chinese uh, ambassadors all over the world now uh, uh, calling uh, Mr. Abe troublemakers. Uh, how long do you think uh, this continues? Uh, or um, in order uh, for the Chinese uh, leader or uh, scholars like you or uh, diplomats uh, uh, to uh, stop referring to the Japanese leader troublemaker, what does Mr. Abe uh, has to do? Thank you very much. We'll keep questions brief, please. We'll put them all in. Yes. Amy Kellogg from Fox News. Mahmoud, Hi, just wondering if you think that Iran actually could have been useful at the Geneva talks or whether the situation is just too fraught at this point. Also, what will be the repercussions of Iran having been disinvited, if you will, from the talks at the last minute? Thank you very much. So maybe let's start with Jean-Marie's question. John, do you want to pick up on that, on non-traditional um, uh, non threats? Um, you don't have to. You can pass it off if you want to. No. <laughs> um, I think the panelists did what they were asked, which is to talk about these, these power struggles. And I think it's also true that 2013, 2014, 
um, characterized by the sort of revenge of geopolitics. And so while it was um, uh, quite right to speak about non-traditional threats when there weren't very many traditional threats around, the return of national sovereignty and, 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 and military arms races and non-proliferation uh, meant that these traditional threats couldn't just be called uh, old-fashioned. I think what makes it so much more difficult now for states to deal with these traditional threats is what I've sometimes styled the privatization of foreign policy, that you have companies and you have NGOs and you have uh, popular movements and the like, all, who have, all of whom have a say, including in these big power I issues. Um, at the last IISS Shangri-La uh, dialogue that was held in Singapore, the Chinese Deputy Chief of Staff of the People's Liberation Army stated in public what was then the traditional point of view of China, which is perhaps it might be a good idea to shelve the issues of sovereignty between China uh, and Japan for another generation and let another generation solve them and let's get on with, with economic uh, growth. When he returned to China, about 400,000 netizens criticized him for abandoning mm -hmm. uh, the Ch Chinese national strength and he's no longer deputy chief of staff of the PLA with the same responsibilities for military intelligence that he had before. Mm -hmm. um, so these popular forces, I think, are the most uh, challenging um, elements in having uh, balanced reactions to these traditional uh, threats. So there's a non-traditional challenge to tra traditional conflict management. Yeah, maybe, um, Professor Wig, let's can you just pick up on John's point specifically when you address the question as to whether it's time for Chinese ambassadors to uh, stop calling Mr. Um, Abe a problem? Because I think this is very interesting as to the extent to which you think that will be a force in driving Chinese policy going forwards. Well, I assume this... Uh, um, um, this um, wave of uh, criticism of, uh, uh, against Abe um, is has um, maybe two or three uh, factors behind it. One, of course, to express the Chinese frustration uh, with w what Abe did, uh, especially because he didn't do this uh, when he was prime minister for the first time in 2007. But now, in, in his second time as prime minister, he did it. So China really feels frustrated with this. And also try to assuage the public opinion in China. You know, look, you know, even though Abe did this, China is trying to criticize him, condemn him. Okay, so, um, and more importantly, we are trying to prevent Abe from doing this again in the future. That is a big question whether or not uh, 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 Abe will remain a troublemaker in the future depends on whether he will go back to the Yasukuni Shrine. At this moment, he seems to be determined to do that. So if that is the case, I think you, know, you, you, you will hear the, the, this kind of uh, 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 label being repeated again and again. I have a feeling it's not going to be solved in the room today, this one. Uh, Mahmoud, coming back to you in Geneva too, there's a specific question as to uh, when it would have been good to have brought Iran onto this and into this and uh, et cetera. So if you could speak to Amy's question. That'd yeah, be great. two points. One, uh, I think Iran's participation would have certainly been constructive. Um, Iran and Saudi Arabia need both bilateral and multilateral settings uh, to bridge their gaps. That's one. Uh, two, um, I think Americans um, are looking at Iran's regional uh, uh, behavior uh, as an element in their larger uh, uh, approach to Iran. And I, uh, it seems to me that they, their perception was that maybe this is too early to provide Iran with a bargaining chip. Uh, for a, for a resolution of the Syrian problem. But I think uh, given the fact that Iran's uh, foreign policy uh, gladly, increasingly, is going to be subject to the requirements of Iran's national economic development, I think Americans should welcome that Iran is willing to, uh, uh, to uh, talk about its foreign policy in a regional setting uh, with the major powers, Saudi Arabia included. Thank you. Um, Ian Jones coming on. I, yeah. I just want to say economic, we haven't talked much about economics here, but economics are a very big piece of this, right? One of the reasons why I'm so negative on Iran, Saudi Arabia, is precisely because the economics are moving against bringing these countries together. Uh, the Saudis are already under a lot of stress. 
They don't have a significant ally in the United States. They don't have a lot of folks providing them aid. Their you know, dem demography is, is burgeoning, um, and energy prices are going down, and they're likely to go down much further um, as a consequence of a deal. In that environment, it is much harder. The Iranians are, are going to be competing directly against them. It's becoming more zero sum. That makes it hard. China, Japan, the economics cut in the other way. You have two governments that if it weren't for economic integration would probably already be fighting each other in some ways, right? And they're not, in part because you have a China that at the same time that you have all these issues on the security side, you also have Xi Jinping going and telling his state-owned enterprises, you've got to become more efficient. You have to become more transparent. I'm going to cut capital off. And I will tell you that you go one level underneath the central government, you go to local governors, they don't talk about Abe as a troublemaker. No, no, no. They, they have groups of CEOs that go to Tokyo and say, we'd really like some more money, please. The Chinese are very good at understanding that when they want money, they don't talk troublemaker language, right? And, and, and we all are, but the right. Chinese are particularly good at it, right? Um, and, and look, that's not Shinbo's ambit, but that is for other folks. And I think we should recognize that that will help to leaven what otherwise looks like a really divisive geopolitical relationship. I agree completely uh, with John's point that with the, re with the return of geopolitics, the interest in these non-governed areas that are growing goes way down because, you know, they're just bigger fish to fry and less willingness to focus on, you know, impact of Libya. I, th I thought the French did a good job in Mali, frankly, maybe the only thing that Hollande has done appropriately since he's actually been elected. Um, but, but that is an exception. It's not, it's not the rule. Okay, we're going to take a couple of last questions before wrapping up. Gentlemen here and lady here first, then gentlemen over here, we'll bring you the microphone. Yes. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. Uh, I'm Orzala Ashraf Nehmat from Afghanistan. I'm a social activist. Uh, and I'm here to uh, ask that in the context of uh, global security that you have discussed, particularly in light of this uh, somehow reconfiguration of the power relations or emergence of new powers, where do you all think Afghanistan and Afghanistan's crisis is going to lead to? Uh, giving in mind, I'm, I'm sure everyone sitting in this room uh, remembers that Afghanistan is a case indeed of an intensified level of intervention. Mm. The job is not done. The security is not uh, there. The peace has not been uh, uh, sustained or assured. Uh, I would like to put it as a general question to everyone, but particularly I'm also interested to know what does the uh, Iranian uh, government, Rouhani's government, uh, stands on the case of Afghanistan, and particularly I'm also interested to know where China is standing. I mean, generally and also specifically with, about these two countries. Thank you. Thanks, and we'll have the next question then as well before we... Yeah, gentleman in the blue shirt here. Yeah. Hi, Chris Seipel, American, with the role on Council on the Role of Faith. Our Iranian friend said religion is not a factor in the Iranian uh, Saudi competition. I'd like you to explore that just a little bit more. And if it's not a factor, then how does Iranian uh, Saudi rapprochement begin? Are there textbooks and joint research projects and things like that that we saw with the French-German example? And the French-German example started with moral rearmament, which was a secular process, but based in a sort of a common understanding of Christianity. Is there a place for Islamic peace building? OK, thank you both. Um, that, Javier, can we start with you on Afghanistan? Um, in terms of um, well, very I, pertinent I, questions. I don't know if I can give the answer because it's not, uh, it's not uh, anybody knows how, how the answer is going to be. But it's, uh, I prefer to think, uh, I don't know how it's going to be the, uh, the, the, the end. But uh, I think that which uh, that uh, makes us, uh, obliges to think of how we get started in all these uh, situations. And one of the lessons of these uh, years past, uh, probably, is that uh, you cannot uh, enter into a situation like that uh, without knowing what is the, the exit. It's something that we should not repeat in Syria, I think. For instance, if we were to find an agreement on Syria, uh, debasification Syria without any states, it would be a mistake. Uh, so that's a lesson to be learned from the Syrian situation. It has to be an state <coughs> to, to, to organize it. So, but I cannot tell you the, the, the final answer. I wish all the best, but um, I'm sorry for that. No, of course not, of course not, of course not. But uh, I don't see the, the appetite uh, to do it otherwise. It's simply the most but, likely uh, way. It's but it's, it's of course, is not the, the right solution. 
Professor Wu, and then we'll move on to... Well, uh, the Americans are, are leaving Afghanistan and China uh, will miss that. Um, what China has been done so far is trying to consult with uh, Afghanistan's neighbors, Russia, India, Pakistan, and including the United States. Two things. One, what can we do after U.S. withdrawal, NATO withdrawal, to uh, uh, support the uh, peace process in Afghanistan? And secondly, what we can do to deal with the possible security challenge coming out from it? Mm. So, and one more thing from the Chinese side is that we are trying to uh, help the economic reconstruction. And at the end of the day, the, the political stability relies very much on the economic development. Yeah. Um, back, to, back to Iran, can I just hand back to you for just final, very quick concluding remarks um, so that we can have a quick wrap-up from the panel. So there was um, particularly, if there's anything you want to add on Afghanistan, but I think um, also um, to the last question about the role of faith, and um, then we'll wrap up. On Afghanistan, I think uh, Iran is going to be acting more uh, multilaterally with uh, regional countries and also Europeans in the U.S. On uh, religion, uh, there are all sorts of governmental and non-governmental institutions um, with their annual and semi-annual summits between Iran and the Sunni world uh, discussing uh, collaboration and uh, understanding. It's been going on for decades between the two sides. Um, I do believe that's not an input into the decision-making process of either country. Um, uh, I think that's a reflection of it, but deep down, these are two countries competing for uh, regional power and supremacy. And I think the key to it is uh, 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 a change of perceptions on both sides. Um, uh, it is interesting, uh, to me as an Iranian academic, as I go around the world speaking about Iran, um, uh, the group that understands Iran the most in the world is Europe, and then it's uh, Russia, and then it's the United States, Asians, and the least understood is the Arab world. Uh, uh, the, in the Arab world, there is very little understanding of Iranian nuances. Um, of the domestic structure in Iran. They're very much obsessed by individuals at the very top in Iran. Um, th there is very little understanding about the social dynamics in Iran. And I think there, is, uh, I think there are more Europeans traveling to Iran than Arabs, if you uh, compare, mm -hmm. uh, though uh, Iran is a Middle Eastern country. Uh, and in that, in that respect, I think if we look at uh, uh, the issue historically, uh, you will find, uh, uh, you will find uh, uh, very little uh, premise in the region uh, of any country where they have an interest in Iran's empowerment and Iran's national economic development. And I think the only way to uh, overcome this is dialogue cooperation between the two governments. And I think now is the, is the, uh, is the uh, greatest opportunity that we have between the Rouhani government and the Saudi government. Actually, Rouhani does have a very positive image among Saudi leadership, uh, going back to about a decade ago, where he reached a security agreement with them. So I think this is the perfect time to reach an agreement. Okay, so we've had a very strong call there in terms of, um, both in terms of the need of dialogue and understanding. I think that's come through from everybody, but also a moment here. Just to go back along the panel um, from Dr. Solana to the end, and can you each give me one sentence? If you've heard one thing today in the questions or the conversation that you think is an extremely prescient reflection on the time that is to come in the course of 2014, one sentence, what is it? Over to you. Well, one sentence, I, um, I would say that uh, I would like to see the United States not pulling back. <clears throat> Good one sentence. <laughs> John. I think one should look also at the promise and not just the challenge of Iran re-entering the international community as an 
uh, accepted power with a responsible approach to its neighbors and, and the wider international community. And I think this is something not necessarily lost on all Arab states. I think it was noticeable that within a day of the Geneva-Iran non-proliferation talks uh, being concluded successfully, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed of the UAE was very quickly uh, in Tehran and very quickly Foreign Minister Zarif was back uh, in uh, uh, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, and I wonder whether the shifts of thinking might uh, start taking place if ever those three island disputes were actually solved, and, and there are some rumors that two out of the three may be on their way to being solved. And I just wonder what the geopolitical shift might then be if UAE, which has a natural uh, social and economic engagement with Iran, found that there was no structural impediment to them having a stronger relationship with Iran, which some of the other Gulf states were inclined to see uh, Iran as a permanent neighbor and not necessarily a permanent challenge, also re-engage more with that country. Um, one sentence, literally, because we're up to time. Yep, thanks. We are in time when the um, world economy is uh, recovering. It's all the more important to manage where the political and strategic relations among the major powers, especially to expand their cooperation on major security challenges while managing their differences. Thank you. If the World Economic Forum had been the World Security Forum, it probably wouldn't still exist. We have to understand whether the economics can trump the lack of mutual understanding in these key issues. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all for coming. Thank you to my fantastic panelists um, for uh, thrashing out the issues. Um, they'll be at the forum. You can pick their brains in the corridors and elsewhere. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.